okay. We're on. And still, not too many of you have left. You are still here. Um, for me, it's very, very important that you don't only read the textbook and learn the U.S. examples, because U.S. examples is very different from Norway. And since you have a U.S. textbook, with a U.S. understanding of industrial organization, I will have to fill the gap. Since you are my students in Norway, you will have, I will have to fill the gap with Norwegian examples. So even though you come from another country, most of you will be familiar <laughs> with the U.S. <laughs> and of course, read the textbook. But all of you will have to learn the difference between Norway and U.S. And some of you will have your job in Norway. Maybe some of you already <laughs> have planned to have a future job in Norway. Then you will have to learn and understand the Norwegian institutional system. I'm going to try to learn you that. And the first example is, of course, from Breaking Bad. <laughs> what happens in the U.S. if you will have a lung cancer and you have no insurance? What happens? If you will have that disease, with no life insurance, the only way out of it <laughs> is the example from Breaking Bad. Because you cannot afford to pay for high quality drugs and high quality surgery. That's too costly. So without an insurance, you will die if you don't have a rich friend <laughs> or if you don't turn into being a criminal. I know, with no insurance. And if you have <coughs> children and you are not rich and your children want either to be a lawyer or study law, as one of my daughters, or you want to be to study medicine and be a surgery, as one of my students working in Tromsø at the hospital now. If you if your daughter or sons will plan for the future, and if you're not rich, no chance. Why? It's too costly to go at good universities. So even though you are talented you and your family is not rich, you cannot afford to pay for a high quality university. That's what Breaking Bad is all about. <laughs> what about Norway? What do we do? We pay taxes. We pay taxes. And when I see my salary, it I only see my salary after tax. So they just collect the tax directly from this specialized university. So I only see my salary minus what I pay 
in taxes. And why do I accept to pay more than 40% of my salary in tax? Why do I accept it? The only reason for me to accept it is that I know that everybody in Norway will have to pay taxes. Nobody, if you are a lawyer or a doctor in Norway, it's not like in Greece <laughs> that you can just hide your salary. All the lawyers that earns a lot, I definitely know that he earns a lot, but he pays a lot of taxes. And I have a good salary, and I'm quite happy to pay my taxes. Why come? What do I get back? Since all the Norwegians pay taxes with a very, very high tax level, when I go to the hospital, if I will have lung cancer, and if they will discover it at the best hospital in Norway, I will have the same operation, the same medicine, for free, for free. It doesn't cost me anything. And if they find out that since your body is uh, disabled, and since it's so difficult, we have to send you to US and pay them in, they'll do that. Pay for them. So we are already insured by paying taxes. Who do you think pay for my wheelchair? <laughs> this new wheelchair has a price level with this new computer <laughs> of approximately 150,000 Norwegian kronos. Do you think I pay myself? Because here, it is a kind of justice. Have any of you read rules? Rules, theory of justice. Have any of you read that one? Rules, theory of justice. We just practice that theory. If you have been unlucky, like me, and it's not my responsibility that I got this disease. It's a very, very, very seldom muscle disease. And since I was unlucky with a draw, we just say that the state will cover all my extra expenses everything. I don't even pay for my car. I have a Mercedes V2. I don't even pay for that car. Because I need a highly specialized car and I could drive that uh, for myself for a long one. And I just paid a little bit. <coughs> and the rest of that car when they built it to fit my needs, the cost of that car was 840,000 Norwegian kroners. 840,000 did my Mercedes Vito cost me, cost the state, 10 years ago. I got it for free, close to. And I don't even pay the expenses to use it. Because there is a system telling me that everybody that has been unlucky 
in the lottery will every month have 2,000 Norwegian kroners to cover all the expenses on the car. So in addition to having a car for free, they pay for what it costs me. 2,000 a month, that's <coughs> quite an amount. I don't drive that much. And I don't need the money <laughs> because I have a high salary. And I have homeowners coming home to me every morning. There is a very nice girl, <laughs> and mo most of my friends envy me that. It's a very nice girl that will come half past eight every morning and see you have had your coffee again, you have read your newspaper, Target's Nine Sleep, and now. You want to go to job. And she will help me. Very nice girl. <laughs> All my friends envy me that. And then in the evening, there will be another one. Now you need to go to bed. <laughs> so I go to bed and she helps me. What do you think I pay? Nothing. Nothing at all. That is for free. So the hospitals is for free. All the people that will be disabled will have the wheelchair available, cars available, home nursing available for free. And my girls, they went to the best universities and I paid nothing because we do it through taxation. So one of the most important institutions in Norway, do you know what that is? We all pay taxes and we are happy to pay. <laughs> And when it comes to the responsibility for the state, 45% of GDP goes through the state, coming in as taxes and again distributed to all the Norwegians to cover all the pensions, the hospitals, universities so that we have a fair system theory of justice hmm? not bad not bad so we don't when we compare us to US this is the first reminder in the textbook and you see from my transparency, there is something called basics. Through basics, you will once more have to go through what is the meaning behind efficient markets. What does it mean? A competitive market that is efficient. The difference between U.S. and Norway is that U.S. they believe in efficient markets. And the reason for the financial crisis was the belief in the, finan in the financial system of efficiency. They just believe that this financial system had so much information that these subprime loans that were distribu distributed all over the world, that the information was good enough to reach efficiency. Nobody understood the risk level within these financial papers. So those people 
responsible to make up the packages with what we call subprime loans. They made those packages so complex that no buyer understood the risk. The German banks bought them, the Swiss banks bought them, the English banks bought them, the Ireland banks bought them, and they were all hit heavily by the financial crisis. Why did not the Norwegian banks buy them? <coughs> they were not allowed to. They were not allowed to. Because the financial system here is regulated. So the financial si crisis did not hit the Norwegian banking system. It didn't cost the taxpayers anything at all. What did it cost the U.S. taxpayers? You name it. First, Lehman Brothers went bankruptcy. Then, the rest of the banks used their power to make the government pay to send the bills to the taxpayers. So finally, the taxpayers paid for all the bonuses that these banks earned. For this is what's called perverse incentives. For every package the staff sold, they got a bonus. <laughs> so they just sold these subprime loans, received the bonus. So the incentive from the head of the banks was to tell them, sell sell. And the buyers didn't understand the risk, so they bought. They left the bill to the taxpayers, and those that earned a lot, they have just hidden. <laughs> they have just hidden themselves, and are rich. Unfair. But here, the taxpayer paid because we have a regulated system and we don't have the same belief in efficient markets. We use the market system as the textbook tells us, but more than most countries, we regulate. So it's right already now to see that yes, this textbook deals also with the Norwegian system, but I will remind you that there is something called market imperfections. All those of you that have read advanced microeconomics, when I remind you what is market imperfections, <laughs> That's what we have understood in our country. We use the market, but here it's heavily regulated, especially, especially because of justice and income distribution. Have any of you read the book of Picti? How many of you have heard of the new book that is read all over the world by all economists, Piketty. Yeah. That's a very good book. And I will just teach a little bit. Telling us the story that the market system is not able to deal with justice, to deal with income distribution, especially not in the US, not in France, but I think I can say no other country in the world go as far in these regulations than Norway. We go even further than Sweden and Denmark, maybe, because of justice. And 
what will the economist say? If you don't believe in efficiency in a market system, you can never be rich. <laughs> so all countries all over the world, when they start to develop their economy, they all over will say that the only way is to introduce a modern market system. They do it in China. They do it in Greece. They do it in all the Afri African countries. They use the market system. But that isn't fair. It doesn't deal with justice. But the belief is that if the market system will be efficient, in the long run, it will be enough for everybody. <laughs> but in the long run, but in the short run, the rich people get richer, the poor people will be more poor. That's how the market system works. But here, the rich people will pay a lot of taxes. The poor people will don't pay that much. And what's distributed out again as a pension is to take care of justice. Justice. So when I will be 70 and be a pensionist, I will be guaranteed very, very high pension. Why come? Why come? And that is the other difference. And I'm going to talk a lot about that. We have one market in Norway that is an important one for the Norwegian economy. What market is that? Mm. Mm. It's the oil market. It's the oil market. In the textbook, you will read a lot about the oil market because U.S. also deals with the oil market. And the cartel, the OPEC cartel, the example is, of course, the OPEC cartel. Norway is not a member. We're not a member of the cartel. But we have been very, very rich on oil since we started in 1969. Do you know where we have put the money? And that is the guarantee that my pension will already be paid for by the investments done. And why come? Some very, very wise people in 1970 said that these oil resources is the property of the Norwegian people owned by the Norwegian people. We didn't sell out to U.S. companies. We just introduced a license and we introduced them to develop our continental shelf with the best technology worldwide. Shell all over the world. They came here the very best companies started to look for oil but we never sold out it was just a license that they will have for a certain period and then it will be returned back to the Norwegian people but these wise people do you know what they did? 
introduced a tax system that the world never ever by man had seen. What did you think that the oil company said that? When we said that, okay, the income from the petroleum companies shall go to the Norwegian people, so the tax level for these companies, can any of you guess what tax level Shell or whatever company will have to pay to the Norwegian state? Guess? No. It's much more than 40%. They pay 78%. So when they earn 100 kroner, 78 will go directly into my pension. <laughs> 78 go directly into my pension. They were wise. What they did. What do you think the US company said? We don't want to be here if the taxes will be that high. <laughs> it's much too much. We don't want to do the job. But finally, they did it. And they earned a lot too. But the Norwegian people earn much more. Much more. So that fund now has the amount of five, it's in between around 5,500 billion kroner. Can you imagine? <coughs> and we don't use it. <coughs> we only use 3% every year paying for pensions, <coughs> schools, only 3% each year. The rest is left for being a pension, a fund that shall last forever. <coughs> So my grandchildren, and I have three, they have been so lucky to be born in Norway. Mm -hmm. They are just drawn the, um, the best they can ever expect to be born here in Norway. Because their future will be safe. Economically, <laughs> anything can happen, but economically, the investment is safe because it's distributed among all countries. So the investments will be in Google, in Apple, in Mercedes, all over the world. And now, more and more of the investments will go in China, in Japan. So we play safe when we invest, have the very best advices in the world to advise where to invest because we can afford to pay the very, 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 very best one <laughs> to give us advice. And therefore, there is no reason for me to invest too much. <laughs> So I just use my money, because I'm safe. How much of the Norwegian Oslo Stock Exchange value do you think is owned by the Norwegian people? The Norwegian, the level of the stock market in Norway. How much do you think that is owned by the state indirectly? 35%? 35%? It's owned by us. There is Statoil. Statoil is the big Norwegian company. And we own 67% <coughs> of Statoil. Aye. And all the Norwegians here 
we own 67% of stuff. What about electricity? Who do you think owns the hydropower system in Norway? 100 years ago, U.S. entrepreneurs came here to develop hydropower in Norway. They were allowed to do it, but the contract said, after 30 years, you deliver it back to the Norwegian people. It's just a loan. You develop. You can earn for 30 years. And after that, you deliver it back. So we are very, very rich on electricity. Not only oil and gas, but clean electricity. Hydropower. Owned by the state. People. The value of that company or that estate is outside England. They invest in windmills, <laughs> wind power. Each terawatt hour invested in wind power offshore has the investment of 10 billion Norwegian crowners. If you call that alternative cost, 10 billion per terawatt hour, the value of the Norwegian hydropower system is 1,300 billion. <laughs> because we already produce more electricity than we need, we export. <coughs> Owned by the people, of course. How come in this strange country we still say we have a market system? And I will explain how this market system works. And within our big petroleum sector, and for the time being, I do research in that sector. I have a research program there, funded by the Research Council. It's a big sector. And they fight for contracts on the same conditions as a company from China. There will be no privileges. If there will be a shipping company that wants to build an offshore service ship vessel to operate offshore, they can formulate a spec that a specification and come up with a bidder's list. They will go to China, to Spain, and to Norway in this region and ask them to come up with a bid. And if it's that all, and this was the master thesis for my <coughs> student this year, the master thesis was this one. Stator came up with a spec. Then one of the competitor is named Ulstein Group. And my master thesis joined me and interviewed. And those of you from Norway, they know the names Tu Ulstein <laughs> and Gunnar Ulstein. And my master candidate joined me when I was invited to take part in their development of their strategy in November last year. Because I do my research in that field. And I asked them if my master student can join me. And they said, they said yes, if you just sign <laughs> the paper of confidentiality. And then I asked, 
can he write his master thesis for you? Dealing with how do they compete for contracts? When Stator announce a spec specification the bid for tender, they invite China's shipyards, Spanish shipyards, and Ulstein Group, a Norwegian one. What will Stuttgart say? We will have fair competition. You compete on price and quality. And I remind you that I will teach over that later on. You compete on price and quality. And you compete on equal level. And we select the best one. Then China will be better than us on price. But when it is advanced offshore vessels, we are much better than the Chinese. We win on quality. On quality. And my students, student, had the opportunity to interview Ulstein or Gunnar Ulstein on exactly this matter from industrial organization, the trade off in competitive tendering, from a, an oil company, the way that complex market works, trade off between price and quality. And then Tora and Gunnar Ulstein said, that's okay. But only if you will join your student. <laughs> <laughs> so my student on that interview had to do it together with me. But that top level gave us two hours in an interview, in a master thesis. <laughs> <laughs> but that was because I said, OK. If you help my student, I will help you and take part in the interview. And when we left, they thanked us and said that we learned a lot. Why? Not because I know their market, but I'm quite good at applied industrial organization. I'm quite good at that. Mm. That knows the maritime industry in this region. So this is how the market works. It's a proper competitive market. Do you know that what this kind of, um, of market uh, in the textbook is called? Those of you, when you compete over prices, the general model from game theory This is a Vatron game on differentiated products. Why differentiated? Because you play over quality. It's not homogeneous product. You play over quality. And you play over price. <coughs> so you are going to learn game theory. That the science of strategy. So you and me, we are going to play <laughs> as players, we play. Game theory is a very, very nice technique to understand in depth complex markets. And you are going to learn it. So this is the big Norwegian petroleum sector where I have my research and I'm going to take advantage of knowing that market very well and you will have to listen to my examples because in this market I go much further than the textbook but it's now much easier to learn it 
because you can just go to that <laughs> video <laughs> and you can see it over and 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 over again <coughs> and over again <laughs> if you don't learn it the first time it's easy to see it once more and within the petroleum sector the Norwegian petroleum sector is the most successful part of the Norwegian economy because they compete worldwide and they are winner in an international market even with a very, very, very high wage level. And why do they win? Because they are innovative, they invest heavily in R&D and they compete on quality, never on price because the wage level is much too high to compete on price but they compete on quality so the biggest most important sector in Norway the petroleum sector and they compete in the world market all over the world after the break I will have some stories to tell you about some other sectors from Norway. So this is only the beginning. And when you end up with a final exam, it's always with a Norwegian exam. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but it's always with a Norwegian exam. No, and then it might be the international example too, but it's always a model from the textbook, but transformed into Norwegian case. Mm. Because you are going to learn about Norwegian economy since you are students in Norway. It's a break. And I will just look around and see how many will leave us now. <laughs> because I'm not tired. I will be more inspired when we meet in a quarter of an hour. Then you just <coughs> turn off the button.